Thank you very much, Jürgen, for the introduction and also for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to speak here. And uh, as Jürgen said, I will talk about the importance of mountains in water resources and we'll take a relatively broad perspective and discuss the topic really from a worldwide viewpoint. High Mountain Asia and the Himalayas are obviously one of the major hotspots in this topic. So even, uh, yeah, the really the major hotspot um, but I will also show examples from modern regions. So to give you a bit of context and give you a comparative overview of this hydrological significance of mountains. So I'll also say a bit later what such an assessment uh, can, can uh, achieve, uh, what, what, can, what it can tell and what it cannot do. So as an introduction, um, I'd like to start with this connection of mountains and water uh, in a broad sense that connection has been recognized uh, a long time ago already uh, to illustrate this I uh, copied here play from a family atlas from the 1830s with the kind of display that was popular around that time uh, we have here all the world's major rivers nicely stretched out so that you can compare their length and all of the world's mountains also nicely arranged by their elevation and this shows that this connection of uh, mountains being this, uh, the, the source regions of the major rivers. This has been made a long time ago already. And when we make it a, a bit more scientifically, a more scientific viewpoint, we have this English term of a water tower that paints quite a nice picture of mountains, what mountains do in the water cycle conceptually. Namely, they gather precipitation, they frequently have more uh, runoff than the surrounding lowlands, thanks to the geographic effect, when they uh, extract water from the atmosphere, when uh, it is uh, forced to lift over the mountain ranges. And then there's a redistribution of those water resources over time. On the one hand, what you could call a bit of a short-term account in snow, seasonal snow cover that melts in spring, and the more sort of long-term bank account in the glaciers, where we have an effect over many years that water resources can be preserved in the mountains and then uh, the melting usually occurs in summer and, and late summer. Now what's the, 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 the challenge, also the scientific challenge with mountains and water? To illustrate this I'd like to use a quite zesty quote by Bit Clemish. She was a, a very distinguished hydrologist and for some years also president of the International Association of Hydrological Sciences and he wrote in 19 88 that in spite of their hydrological importance, mountainous areas represent, practically speaking, some of the blackest of black boxes in the hydrological cycle. And now that's uh, quite zesty and uh, it's not really true anymore. Uh, the knowledge had already improved in the early 2000s, but relatively speaking, it's still true today that challenges for mountain hydrology are considerably bigger than for dealing with lowland areas. And that is because of a number of reasons. One large area of reasons concerns processes in mountain areas. Uh, we have quite a high spatial variability of conditions and processes. Uh, on the one hand, on the horizontal dimension already at distances of a few meters, we have changes. Uh, in slope angle and exposure that, that uh, impact the microclimate and then vertically what you might be very familiar with uh, at ranges of 100 meters or larger we have uh, elevation gradients for instance of temperature and precipitation that then in turn also affect uh, snow and ice processes and also determine whether we have vegetation um, or whether we have not vegetation or sparse vegetation in between something. And at the same time, in mountainous areas, we have relatively limited storage available with some exceptions, but usually storage is quite limited. And this means that as a hydrologist, I have to do really well in understanding hydrological processes in mountains because they are not buffered by a large storage, but really a uh, precipitation event matters quite a lot because it will arrive quite quickly then at the, at the outlet of a mountainous catchment. Now processes, that was one large era of challenges and the other big challenge I think is, uh, is the measurement network and uh, the in situ observations uh, that are not adequate. Uh, to illustrate this, I have this graph here that shows in 
brown the hypsographic curve for the land surface of the air so uh, meaning that a bit more than 15 percent for instance are located between zero and 100 meters above sea level and then uh, we took here two uh, major networks of uh, stream flow gauges and that's blue and the precipitation gauge network also of a big data set in green and we see that at low elevations here, the share of the network that is located at, for instance, at this lowest elevation is larger than the share of land area. So it's rather overrepresentative. Whereas when we go to higher elevations, we see that it becomes underrepresentative. And if I zoom in here for the airs above 1,500 meters, we see that uh, for stream flow gauges, especially, it's already declining quite quickly. And above 3,500, 4,000 meters above sea level, uh, there's really hardly any measurements anymore, but still land surface uh, that we have to understand in terms of processes. We can also break this down into continents uh, that's drawn here now only for the precipitation gauge network. Um, black is all continents together. And then we have, for instance, here the, the blue uh, signature that shows Europe has clearly the highest uh, network density. Um, although the emphasis is also quite marked here at low elevations, around 500 meters above sea level. And then we have a decrease for higher elevations. And if you look at Asia here, the yellow line, uh, this has quite a low density actually. Um, on average, every station uh, has to cover an area of uh, around 5,600 square kilometers. And if we go to the high elevations about, uh, above 2,500 meters, there the, the coverage of one station statistically is over 26,000 square kilometers. So not really high. And we can look at recommendations of the World Meteorological Organization, what they recommend in terms of uh, station network density for precipitation here. And for plains and hills, we see that Europe meets the requirements, but for mountainous areas, the, uh, the density recommended density is actually much higher than for plains and hills because of this heterogeneity of processes that we saw. And none of the networks that we see here, none of the continents uh, really meets those requirements for mountainous areas on average. And just as another example, I drew here uh, the similar curve as we had for the Earth for Switzerland. Switzerland has quite a, a densely developed observational network. But still here we have a concentration of precipitation and runoff gauges at the, in, in the Midlands, at the plateau. And then 1,500 meters, 2,000 meters already here we are at densities that are below the recommendations uh, of the World Meteorological Over uh, Organization. On average, they are met, but for the high elevations, they are actually not met. And uh, just to conclude this, uh, this excursion into the networks, that's another display that we published recently. But this reveals also a bit better the, the spatial and latitudinal distribution uh, of uh, precipitation gauge network. It's a different catalog that we used here, but you see this heavy uh, emphasis on the US and on Europe and also latitudinally, you see that the northern latitudes are very strongly represented, whereas for mid latitudes, for low latitudes, uh, we have quite poor representation of the high elevations. Now, of course, we can still study mountainous areas in terms of hydrology. One way around uh, the, the scarcity of observations is hydrological modeling. We can uh, infer parameters for changes where we for, for models where we have no observations that's feasible, but entails always additional uncertainties, of course. And um, I'd like to really make a, an, an advertisement here for observation networks because all models that we have, they still need observation data for their calibration. And there's no way around the measurements, the, the ground measurements that we just saw.
Now, before uh, we continue with some results on how important mountains are in water resources, we should first briefly also talk about what, what a mountain actually is. This may sound like a bit of a silly question, but it's not as straightforward as you see in a minute. And just to illustrate the challenge a bit on a, on a different level, I put here this captcha that I got some time ago. I found this quite funny that Google asked me to identify pictures with mountains to prove that I'm not a bot. And if we take it a bit more um, on the definition side, now really looking for a definition of mountains, and if we go to a dictionary, it doesn't really help us a lot. Um, in the Merriam-Webster, for instance, uh, the definition of a mountain is just a landmass that is uh, above its surroundings, higher than a hill. And also in a classic here, Mountain Geographic by Roderick Peaty in 1935, the definition or the characterization of mountains is relatively uh, undistinct with a conspicuous elevation, impressive bulk and so forth. Um, and of course we can make definitions, for instance, like how, how a prominent mountain peak should see, be or how dominant it should be above its surrounding area. But that's always subjective where we set those thresholds. And the challenge isn't smaller if we are speaking not about mountains themselves, but really about mountainous areas what we want to study in the following. And uh, there are excellent high resolution data on our surface today, um, but the conundrum is, is still around what, how do we define a mountainous areas? And just for illustration, I put here three popular uh, frequently used mountain definitions. I go a bit back and forth between them. And you see that they do differ. Um, not fundamentally, they agree about, about uh, where here, for instance, high mountain Asia is located, but there are quite some differences, for instance, uh, for the definition of uh, elevated plains or inner alpine valleys or the boundaries of the mountainous era. Um, low, mount, low mountain ranges or the Mittelgebirge in German. And you see this here very clearly, for instance, for the plateau of Tibet that sometimes is included uh, here by the definition by Valerie Kapos and colleagues. Uh, and here in a different definition uh, by Christian Kerner and colleagues, it is not included here. Uh, Karagal et al. is partly included. And also we also see this in different parts here of high mountain Asia. And uh, taking the Alps as a different example, switching a bit region, also here the conundrum is the same. For instance, very specific is Zurich part of the Alps or not? And um, that is not, not so clear if we compare those different definitions. And you can even take it further, this mountain definition. This is something I found in the Alpine Convention, uh, already quite a long time ago, published where the, the this sphere of influence or an era of influence of the Alps was defined, uh, because here, even as far as Nuremberg, Munich, Stuttgart, and so forth, the Alps have an impact, and there are close connections in terms of tourism, traffic, air quality, water resources, energy production, and so forth. So I may have talked myself a bit into trouble by highlighting that it is not so easy to define mountains or mountainous airs, but the point that I want to make is that there is not one universally valid definition. It really depends on the intended purpose, whether you want to study bi biodiversity or geology or economic uh, connections. And the delineation that I will use in the following is this one here. Um, it's clearly geared towards water resources and population. And it was first devised by Michel Mebeck on the basis of relief roughness and elevation. And uh, we updated it recently to a much higher resolution, around nine kilometers at the equator. And if we see, the, if you look at the, the distinction that we make here between mountainous areas and lowland areas, um, we are quite generous with including land surface area into the mountainous category close to 40% are mountainous in, in this definition that we used here and the remaining era is lowlands. And this is of course quite black and white and the transition between mountainous and lowland will be more much more smooth in reality. And uh, 
we were quite generous because we also wanted to include elevated hills, for instance, for a later study and then hydrologically what importance they have for the lowlands. And I should really also mention that the, the population data set that used uh, that is used matters also somewhat um, and other assumptions uh, that we that we put into uh, such an analysis. Now let's first have an, an, a rough overview of this uh, of this uh, water tower function of mountains. That's from a piece of research that is already quite uh, old. Um, we made here a first overview on the basis of runoff data that were available in the early 2000s. And you see here the the large blue triangles, those are the major water towers that we identified. And I show this because it, 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 this analysis shows nicely a bit the, this function of mountains as water towers again, in that they are uh, sort of wet islands within a drier a surrounding. For instance, if you look at the Nile, um, here the, the mountainous areas are actually in the close to the tropical area, but then uh, those send their water through really, really dry lowlands uh, where this mountainous water is really uh, of critical importance. Similar also, for instance, for the Niger or for Central Asia or for uh, South Asia and so forth around high mountain Asia. So that's a bit this basic pattern that we have in this water tower function. And uh, we later made an analysis with, uh, with global hydrological models, a bit more detailed mapping mountainous areas um, and differentiating more in detail their function for the lowlands. And here those yellow, orange, red colors uh, they mean that the mountains provide water surpluses to a lowland that has itself a water deficit. So there are important surpluses coming from the mountains. We found that around 7% of mountainous areas worldwide fulfill such an essential role for lowland water resources. And then uh, we have another category here that is important, the green one, around 37% of the mountainous areas are in this one. And this means in the lowlands, there is no water deficit, but still the mountains provide an important surplus that can be important, for instance, for uh, hydropower production or for buffering seasonal shortages or for river navigation. And overall, um, in this analysis, we found that around 45% of mountain areas worldwide are of significant importance for lowland water resources. And now these figures that I showed you did relate to mountainous areas. They detailed for the mountainous areas what their importance might be for the adjacent lowlands. And now I would like to switch the perspective, not look from the mountains downstream, but look upstream from the lowlands or more simply uh, examine here uh, for the population in the lowlands to what extent they depend on the mountains and try to quantify roughly how many people in the lowlands depend on mountain water resources. And incidentally, the sketch that I show here uh, is an illustration from the late 1980s uh, that presented the concept of highland lowland interactions was from a publication by Jack Ives and Bruno Messerly. Uh, entitled a research strategy for the Himalaya, Himalayan region. And it also had this highland lowland aspect and differentiation that I uh, show you now. Now for the analysis that I will uh, go through with you together, we can make use of a recent global hydrological models. We used here PCR GLOB WB. Um, and that's a model that on the one hand simulates runoff by means of different storages that respond to meteorological input. And on the other hand, and that's particularly important now in our context, this model also has representations for human water consumption. That is, it simulates water abstractions and returns flows from irrigation, from industry and from households. And it, with regard to mountainous areas, it is important to note that snow and glaciers are represented, although in a relatively simple approach with a degree day uh, factor. And uh, for the glacier, currently there is not yet a change in glacier areas. We are working on that, but here it is not yet implemented. Whereas uh, we have changes in climate and in population that are considered and also in 
in the socioeconomic scenarios. And just a sketch of how the analysis was done. I don't want to go into the details here, but just emphasize that the relevant and appropriate unit of analysis in our context is now always a river catchment. So we always have to compare upstream in a river catchment with downstream in a river catchment. And um, we, are look, we were looking in this analysis for at river catchments one by one, assessing, for instance, the, the amount of runoff that uh, was available as a surplus from the mountainous areas. And then we distributed that, for instance, over the lowlands and uh, assessed how important that might be for the lowland population and for their water use. And uh, let's have some first results here to look at. Um, first here, the beginning of the 21st century, we see again this differentiation in colors that we already had before, with yellow, orange, red showing essential now dependence of the lowland people on mountain water resources. And here we found uh, that around 1.8 billion people or close to 40% of lowland population depend quite strongly on mountain water surpluses and another 1.1 billion or 24% uh, benefit from supportive surpluses from the mountainous areas. And with uh, the data that we have available today and with the scenario projections that we have available, we can also draw timelines that are quite interesting um, from the 60s here to the 2040s. And here I use the middle of the road scenario, SSB 2 6.0. And uh, we see that the number of people in the lowlands depending strongly on mountain water sources uh, has risen quite strongly in the past decades and is also projected to rise in the future to around 2.5 billion or close to 40% of the lowland population. Now, with such an analysis and at the global level, that's always a bit unfair. It doesn't reveal the, all of the relevant details as we saw before, because uh, the, the climate, the surrounding climate of the lowlands, that is really important in determining how important uh, the, the surpluses of the mountainous areas are. And for this reason, I briefly show you here um, a breakdown into different climate regions again now here until mid-century and the blue figures here they are the lowland population by mid-century under this SSB2 uh, scenario and we see that the north middle altitude climate zone is uh, the, the richest in population and is also quite similar to the global picture we saw but there are also other regions that are uh, quite noteworthy or even uh, more marked in their lowland dependence. Uh, and I'd like to highlight here, especially uh, the North Dry climate region, uh, where we have almost two thirds of the lowland population depending heavily on mountain runoff by mid-century under this scenario, or also in the South subtropical uh, climate region, we have quite a high dependence. Now, to illustrate a bit how this water is used in the lowlands, this mountain water, I'd like to show some regional examples. Um, a very obvious one is the Indus River. Um, as I said, High Mountain Asia is really the hotspot, probably global. And in the Indus River, this appears really uh, in, a, in a stark manner. We see here this, this uh, green band around the irrigation network that appears here in a very dry lowland climate. and uh, the irrigation system here has quite a lot of superlatives to show in terms of channel length, irrigated area. It's the world's largest connected irrigation area. And it also has a significant contributions from snow and glacier melt and uh, has a high importance in uh, Pakistan's economy. And I'd like to show also some other examples of how mountain waters are used now here with interbasin transfers, that is water that is diverted from one river catchment into another river catchment. And one large important example here is in China, the South North Water Transfer Project that has been realized to a large part already. It started uh, in uh, the mid 20th century 
And uh, the routes here, they have quite a large capacity, 800 to 1,000 cubic meters per second each, and around 1,000, 1,200 kilometers each. And now, of course, such transfers, they are made to supply a, a benefiting region uh, with water resources, with additional water resources, but they also raise quite a lot of criticism and issues here specifically in this case. Um, the problem is, for instance, that in the lower regions of the Yangtze River, uh, the dilution uh, of the of wastewater is much reduced because of the reduced flow, and this means that the pollution of the river has increased. And criticisms that were raised also in this case, and that also apply to many similar uh, projects, uh, were that for alternatives like reducing water demand have not been considered sufficiently. And here in this case, actually, the water problems in the north got worse because the irrigation was so much expanded there in the in the receiving region and also a point of uh, criticism here and frequently in other such projects is resettlements here it was around 330,000 people that had to be resettled uh, there's even larger projects in the thinking for instance here also concerning high mountain asia this india uh, river linking project uh, the idea goes back in its roots to the British colonial time and it has survived until today. Whether this will ever be built is, uh, however, uncertain uh, because the impacts of linking up here the rivers in the south uh, to connect the mountainous areas and especially also in the north to benefit from mountainous runoff, those impacts would really be massive for the environment and the ecology and also for society. And just a third example of a large scale interbasin water transfers that benefit from mountain waters is here in the, in the Sierra Nevada in California, the Central Valley project uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, this is operational since the 1960s and the runoff here from the Sierra Nevada mountains is distributed over a vast area in the lowlands across boundaries um, in the Central Valley and below. This is a major agricultural era famous for instance for producing almonds and even the Colorado River here in the south is tapped and part of its water is diverted northwards towards greater LA as we see here in one of those impressive channels. And uh, the last example I'd like to show here with interbasin transfers is uh, from uh, Switzerland and Germany from Lake Constance. It's a bit smaller in scale uh, but nevertheless I think it's quite interesting and uh, worthwhile studying. Um, water from the Alps has quite a high quality, so here it is also used in the Neckar River catchment in south of Germany. And the water transfers from Lake Constance, they are used here to uh, supply households with additional water. Now, in terms of the amount of water that is taken from Lake Constance here, um, the, the, this transfer is not so noteworthy, it's about 1% of the lake outflow, but still what is really striking a bit or remarking in this uh, case is that it's cheaper to use water from Lake Constance that originates from the Alps than to process the water in the river, Neckar River Basin. Uh, this area here is densely populated, the Neckar river re receives a lot of wastewater that has been processed by sewage treatment plants but still the dilution is insufficient uh, especially during low flow periods and therefore uh, for instance swimming is prohibited here in the Neckar river and uh, the alps really function here as a sort of water tank uh, for the Neckar river and with this, I'd like to go back to our global analysis. I already showed you some, some trends over time, very generic for climate regions, for the world. And now we can also look at more detail into spatial patterns. We have here uh, a nine kilometer resolution model results. And I just picked here two map excerpts because they show a nice overview and show uh, interesting examples. We should not forget about different regions that also have important water towers and important population in the lowlands benefiting from them. Nevertheless, here for those two map 
extends. Uh, we have again this color coding that you already saw a couple of times. And now here's an additional dimension with population density. So uh, fully saturated color means that uh, population density in the lowlands is high. So we should really care about the results of this uh, typology because it affects many people, whereas uh, dark colors means low population density and not so uh, important regions in terms of, of a lowland population. And if we go briefly through this example here, through, through those two examples um, and start on the right, we really see this obvious hotspot around high mountain Asia. That's really not at all surprising um, and also major a major part of the research um, on this topic is uh, focused here on high mountain Asia. Uh, and here in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, I'd like to highlight this because it really shows nicely how this typology that I show you here differentiates the lowland climate. So here in the east, uh, we can see that the dependence of the lowland population is not that high because that's a region that receives abundant precipitation, has abundant lowland water resources. Whereas when we go here uh, to the west uh, in the Indo-Gangetic uh, Plain here towards the Indus especially, we see that uh, the dependence grows much stronger because the lowland climate is so much drier. So high mountain Asia, probably the major hotspot, but I'd like to highlight there here that there are also other interesting hotspot regions that deserve study and that are important to understand. For instance, here Mesopotamia with the Tigris and Euphrates rivers or the Nile River or West Africa with the Niger River and parts of Europe even, although more in the supportive category, but still we have some uh, more heavily dependent regions downstream in, in Italy, for instance, or in the lowlands of the, of the Danube River. And if we jump over to the Western US uh, and Mexico, there we can see that the dependence of the population in the lowlands is also quite high on both sides of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, on the Western side here in the Central Valley, in the Sonoran Desert, uh, and on the Eastern side here in the Great Plains. And this Dependence really also extends further north and further south um, to Canada uh, and to uh, Mexico. And what I show you here is now a breakdown to individual river basins. Um, we estimated here the, the total lowland population uh, depending heavily on mountain runoff. And you see here in this ranking, and I show here the, the, the 10 river basins with highest dependent population by mid-century. We see here Ganges, Paramatutra, Meghna is first and Indus is third. And then the second one is also one that has its uh, sources in the high, mountain, uh, high uh, mountain Asia region, the Yangtze River. And uh, taken together, they have a projected population of uh, 770 million. Now Ganges and Indus together. And uh, if we look at the projections for the Indus River, uh, we see that population growth there is quite striking in the lowlands, quite strongly. Uh, Five-fold population growth projected uh, from 60s to mid-century. And in terms of uh, water consumption, per capita water consumption decreases quite strongly there in this region by almost two thirds by increasing efficiency. But on the other hand, uh, we have this population growth that makes it uh, happen that the dependence of the lowlands is uh, always high between, in our estimate, 90 and 95 percent of the lowland inhabitants depend on mountain water resources. And of course, such an estimate really depends on a number of assumptions. I should emphasize it again, uh, what part of the lowland area is dependent, how um, water is distributed, with the, what sort of mountain definition, lowland definition do we use, what is the population database. And um, just another table here uh, from this analysis, it's now here ranked by country. And also here we see that the top three countries, depending on mountain water resources in the lowlands, are again around high mountain Asia. And 
really I'd like to emphasize what such an analysis at global scale can do and what it cannot. So it can provide a comparative overview that I tried to give you here. Uh, it can show priorities, it can show a ranking, and it can show sort of ballpark figures um, on the basis of which we can decide which regions are really important or key regions for the future. What it cannot do is give you accurate numbers to support, for instance, a regional planning or the operation of a certain reservoir. This would really require more detailed studies for the region in question, even though there may always be a lack of data in many mountainous regions, including high mountain Asia or the Andes. And such estimates should then always be enriched with the, the few regional information that we have that is available. So after this uh, overview of population and more details of population, I'd like to switch um, to a different uh, metric or a different unit to look at, and that is irrigation. Uh, so far, we have been looking at lowland population, but we should really remind ourselves that Irrigation, irrigated agriculture is the major user of water uh, resources. Globally, it's around 70% of water consumption that is due to irrigated agriculture. And here in this uh, map of era percentage of the era ir equipped for irrigation by Stefan Siebert from 2005, we see also very nicely that uh, the indo gangetic plain here is a major hotspot or the global hotspot again, also from the viewpoint of irrigation. And this analysis that I showed you here for population, we did a similar analysis also for irrigation. Um, very simply here uh, with the color coding a bit changed. Now the, the saturated colors don't show high population density, but they show a high percentage of the era equipped for irrigation. So if the colors are bright, we should care about results in terms of irrigation water resources. And if we compare those two maps, I think that's quite interesting. If we go again from east to west, we see around high mountain Asia, also Central Asia, China, South Asia, we see that the, those two maps here, they look quite similar. So we could say that high mountain Asia is a hotspot globally uh, for mountain water resources in the lowlands, not only from the point of view of population, but also from the point of view of irrigation. And we have similar findings here for Mesopotamia or for the lower, lower reaches of the Nile River. Whereas here for uh, Western Africa, for the Niger River, for instance, we see that irrigation doesn't seem to be that important. Now, that may a bit of problem with the data because in this region um, irrigation abstractions are frequently not recorded or even made illegally to quite a large extent so the importance of mountains for irrigation here might be underestimated uh, here in western africa but still i think what we can say is that the the order of magnitude is still a different one and when we compare it here to the Indo-Gangetic Plain. And here in North America, if we compare that um, east of the Rocky Mountains in the Great Plains, we see that here irrigation is actually more, uh, more uh, strongly appearing in this typology. So this is even more an irrigation hotspot uh, than a population hotspot, whereas uh, west of the Rocky Mountains in the Central Valley on those regions. Uh, this again, comparable the importance for irrigation with the importance for uh, population. And what I should mention, also a limitation of this research at global scale, we do not consider interbasin transfers. For instance, this Central Valley project that I showed you, we cannot implement that yet because we don't have the data uh, required to do this at the global scale. And if we would be able to do this, I would expect even a higher importance, for instance, here in the Colorado River Basin. So let's stick a bit uh, with uh, irrigation yet um, and uh, break this down here. First of all, the overall lowland area uh, equipped for uh, irrigation. That's those circles here, 1960s, 2000, and 2030s. 
And we can now differentiate uh, what part of this lowland era equipped for irrigation depends on mountain runoff, that's here the pink share of the pie and which one doesn't. And on top of that, and I think that's an important differentiation to make, um, we have also uh, looked at the lowland regions that make unsustainable use of their local water resources. So that over abstract the water resources that they have locally. And therefore, if they depend on mountain water resources, this dependence is even stronger because their local water resources are uh, in parable or uh, used uh, unsustainably. So we see that by mid-century again, under this SSP2 6.0 scenario, we see that more than 50% of the lowland area equipped for irrigation might be both depending on mountain uh, runoff and also overuse their local water resources. And again, here it is important to make a regional differentiation. I'd like to show that here briefly without going into all the details. Um, but we see again here the percentages of lowland era. Um, here now the, the dark pink is those two critical conditions depending and unsustainable use. And we see that in the North Dry region, for instance, here really a vast share of the lowlands is projected to uh, be under those critical conditions by mid-century. Now, what I would like to reveal as sort of uh, going slow towards an end of my presentation, what I would like to study before the end is also the drivers behind the developments that we saw. What is responsible for the developments that we saw? Is it changes in runoff or is it rather water consumption? Is it something happening in the mountains or happening in the lowlands? So if we go through it first here, we see runoff. Now, those are decadal averages of runoff differentiated for mountain areas and for lowland areas. And here at the scale of decadal averages, we don't really see a change happening. So this looks relatively stable. Um, we would have a, a shift in seasonality, runoff seasonality that is not shown here. I'll come to this in a minute. Uh, but at the level of decadal average is really the runoff is relatively stable over time. So we probably have to look in water consumption. That's the first uh, facet of water consumption here, per capita water consumption. Again, decadal averages for lowland areas globally and mountain areas globally with uh, projections according to different SVP, SSPs for the future. And also here we see if anything is changing, then it's rather declining. So we are getting a bit more efficient in using water. So this can also not be the explanation, but the explanation is here in total population. Population growth here in the lowlands, in the mountains, we see that this is really strong in both regions, especially marked in the lowlands. And overall, this increasing population more than offsets the the more efficient water use and overall total water consumption is rising really strongly and markedly in the lowlands, also in projections for the future. So this overall consumption is, uh, is really important. It dominates the, the picture that we see here and um, changes in mountain low and lowland runoff and in mountain water consumption, they are a bit less decisive here. Now, I want to make two uh, disclaimers or, or qualifiers here to those findings, um, also pointing to future research, what we plan to study and what should be studied in the future. Um, we have not studied here yet changes in snowmelt runoff seasonality. And in this uh, aspect of mountain water resources, of course, we do see a change already in the past decades. It's very well documented, for instance, for the, for the Rocky Mountains. And this is something quite unfavorable. If the snowmelt runoff arrives earlier in the year in the lowlands, it may not coincide that nicely anymore with the uh, strongest uh, vegetation growth period in the low. So that's something unfavorable that we do not study here yet. And the other uh, qualifier I would like to make uh, concerns glacial melt runoff. 
also there changes can be highly relevant and we don't study them here yet. That's something we're, we're working on, but here it's not implemented yet. Um, and also here, a bit of differentiation has to be made um, very broadly speaking at the global level. If you look at all the, the river mouths of the major rivers, um, you can say that a glacier melt runoff becomes less and less important the far away you go from the mountainous ranges. Um, that's also true for Europe. Even in, in, in dry years, the glacier component um, decreases with distance from the mountains. And there are some important exceptions where glacier melt runoff has a, quite a long range effect uh, on, on downstream flows. Um, and those are especially the tropical Andes and the upper Indus River Basin. So with that, uh, let me come to some conclusions. Again, here I stay at a broad overview level, trying to find a bit of conclusions uh, that, that could be inferred from this global overview, from this global comparative overview that I showed you. So I hope I was able to convince you that lowlands benefit considerably from mountain runoff. So what does this mean really at the very, very broad generic level? Um, one uh, conclusion that we can make is that climate action is really imperative when we look at mountain water resources. And this now concerns especially the, the enhanced warming that we have in mountain regions and their Im this, the impact of this enhanced warming on water resources originating from uh, snow and from uh, ice. So we really have to do the best job we can to limit further changes in seasonality of mountain runoff because they are potentially um, unfavorable for the lowlands because they shift the coincidence with the lowland vegetation growth period. Um, another broad uh, conclusion is that sustainable mountain development in mountain areas is really important if we want to uh, safeguard the quality of mountain runoff. And this conclusion also very nicely coincides with the UN International Year of Sustainable Mountain Development uh, that has been announced uh, for 2022. And uh, the last conclusion I'd like to make uh, centers around this term of hydrosolidarity. I really liked this term. It was coined by uh, Malin Falkenmark in the 90s. Um, and it means that um, all activities that relate not only to water, but also to land use and ecosystems, that all those activities should be orchestrated with a, a, a broad perspective, with the perspective of the river basin, with the upstream populations and the lowland populations. If we look at this highland lowland perspective that we have now here, and this is really, I think, an opportunity to connect lowland and mountain uh, parts of river, despite of differences that there, there might be. And I think it might also be a, a powerful tool to avoid conflicts over water resources in such a highland lowland setting. So uh, with this, I thank you very much. For